The Big Ten is now the Big 38 with some new team additions on the West Coast. ESPN shares what it thinks it, Michigan needs to do if it's going to win a national championship. And we'll get into some other stuff here on this episode of Locked On Wolverines. You are Locked On Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Friday, the Locked On Wolverines podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I'm your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. And Big Ten expansion is back. That 2024 schedule that everyone was so excited about, well, you can just go ahead and throw that in the paper shredder. Forget that ever existed because it's going to be a little bit different, it looks like. Um... Did I mention who I am, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverine's Wire? I don't even remember. Uh, see, hence the, the, does Jim Harbaugh remember if he recalls if he bought a, a recruited cheeseburger? I don't even remember if I said my name 30 seconds ago. <laughs> so, again, I've been hit on the head less. I digress. Uh, so the Big Ten is a, it's uh, adding Oregon and Washington to its uh, membership uh, institutions, member institutions. Thus, the Big Ten is getting bigger again. So now there are four West Coast teams. The Big Ten will have 18 schools. I cannot get this microphone to stay. Uh, 18 schools now. Four on the West Coast, and then the furthest West otherwise is Nebraska. Nebraska, Iowa. So... That's where we're at. That is happening. There, there was certainly some buzz about this move happening. And then it kind of went by the wayside for a little bit. Uh, and then in last 24 hours, uh, it was kind of a will they, won't they. It was, oh, they're going to the Big Ten. And then it was like, oh, well, it looks like they're going to stay at the Pac-12. And all of that. So, uh, officially, that 2007 loss to... Uh, to Oregon was a Big Ten game, and that uh, win over Washington in 2021 was a Big Ten game. So, good, good times. Rose Bowl in the early 90s against Washington, Big Ten games. Big Ten champion versus Big Ten champion. Who knew? Uh, so, if you couldn't tell by my tone, I am not the biggest fan of this. I... I I liked USC and UCLA to some degree. It felt like a little bit of a novelty to some degree. But at the same time, I I didn't love that either because I do like the idea that these conferences are essentially, for the most part, regional uh, collections of schools. Now, certainly the ACC's bucked that to some degree, as has the American at times, or, you know, it's... I, I like it more when it's like, okay, these these schools are all, if you want to drive it, you can do it in a day, right? Like you can, you can make it to that school driving. If you leave on Friday at noon, you can be sure that you're going to be able to get into a hotel. You're going to be able to uh, wake up and be at a, a noon kickoff game if you want to. Certainly some schools are, Further away than others, I, I drove to uh, Minnesota in 2020. Didn't feel like flying. Certainly could have done it. I just was kind of after all the COVID of it all. I mean, there, we're still very much in it, right? We had to wear masks everywhere. Um, uh, I decided that I wanted to drive that. I just I wanted a road trip. It was fun on the way there, awful on the way back. It was icy conditions from Minneapolis to Madison. That was a 10-hour drive, right? But, like, that was, it. you know, it, you, know you have your sense of adventure you know i've dri- i haven't driven to a maryland game but i've driven to dc on on behalf of the job the 2017 satellite camps driven there and back that's doable Rutgers. i mean i've driven to new jersey when my aunt and uncle were living in uh, eastern pennsylvania i drove out there went to new york that's all doable i haven't driven to nebraska for anything football related that's a kind of a flying one for me i feel um i've driven to iowa a couple times now, I've driven to Los Angeles, but that wasn't because 
I was going out there for something football related. I was going out there to restart my life on the West Coast in 2008. And, but it, having one city and was one thing, but then adding Oregon and Washington. Now, what I'm hoping is that if, let's just say this stands pat, and it's probably not going to, that the Big Ten is smart about its scheduling, and I don't know how much it's going to be able to, and that teams only have to make one inter, um, inter-season travel game in the uh all, all the way out west for especially for the ones that the schools like michigan michigan state ohio state penn state rutgers maryland i mean that's a trek to go 2000 2000 plus miles across the country midweek and that's a lot for for players it's it's one thing to do it once or you know once a year and who knows what you know non-conference games that some of these teams might have right but it's just it's asking a lot. So I, I don't like the, the lack of regionality. The Big Ten being known as this, you know, hard nosed football conference that's going to run the ball and punt. I mean, those days are essentially over as much as college football modernizes it. They're over even just because now there's just more and more schools that just don't adhere to those uh, principles anymore. Right. You don't look at Oregon and say that. I mean, maybe Washington and at times USC, but now you're you're not just fundamentally changing the complexion of the conference. Uh, and as far as the teams and the geography, you're, you're changing the ethos of, by which the Big Ten has been known by. Now, if this means that there's further expansion to the point where you have the SEC and the Big Ten, both have like 24 schools each. Okay, I, I think I can live with that if you still hyper-regionalize things again. But then it's, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult because essentially if they're 24 teams each or something like that, which I mean isn't far-fetched, has six more teams. You know, Cal and Stanford could be on the way. Florida State, Clemson could be on the way. Then you're just right there. You're right, you're right near those numbers. Once you get to that point, I mean, how representative is your champion? Because then you almost need a playoff within the conference. And that just becomes problematic, I think. Now, if the reason why I say this now, I was, I was riding with, uh, on Tuesdays, uh, I go and uh, ride around with Pastor JD from my church for a little bit. And uh, we were talking about the idea of having relegation. You know, the, the top, the, you know, the top team in the lesser conferences moves up and the other team falls out. Now, that would be awesome. I love that. I was like, we just saved college football. But at the same time, there's no way that these conferences would let that happen. Right. Because, you know, to, to for Michigan to go through a Rich Rod 2008 uh, eight type of year and then maybe drop out, you lose your cash cow to the group of five. That's never going to work. So. I don't like this. This feels like a lot of greed and the types of things that are starting to ruin college football. If anything, we need to reset back to the days of the Big East, the, the Big Ten at worst with the addition of Nebraska. I, I like the Rutgers and Maryland additions for the sake of my own personal. I enjoy traveling to those games and, and, and getting to partake in D.C. and New York City and all of that. We, we've just crossed a Rubicon that I'm not a big fan of here. Uh, I don't know how you feel, uh, but this is, it's just too much. It's just too much. And in, in terms of trying to be the most forward-thinking conference, I feel like the Big Ten has jumped the shark because I, I don't care that you're the first, like, real coast-to-coast, -coast, New York to L.A. It's just it's, it's clearly motivated by finances. Good for those formerly Pac-12 teams that are going to get their paydays, but it, this is still, it's, and I like big, big matchups, right? I would rather see Michigan play Oregon or Washington than I'd rather see Michigan play Indiana or Rutgers, right? But at what cost? That's, that's all I'm saying. There's got to be a better way to do this. This way is not the way to go. Let's talk about ESPN's um, what ifs, what if Michigan needs to do in order to win a national championship in 2023. 
let's stay on track with this year because we can worry about all of this other craziness next year. Next offseason, it's going to be wild. Before we do that these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. And you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you've got to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. So like say, for instance, you're, you're a football conference and you want to add another team. It's the same type of thing, <laughs> adding a job at LinkedIn Jobs. Is up there. It's a lot easier than getting a bunch of conference presidents to uh, to vote. Uh, but after you do post your job, super simple, super easy. You just list it. You add that purple hashtag hiring frame to let everyone know that you are, in fact, hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. So going a little bit more closer to the vest, just like Michigan needed to go out and get the right candidates, and they did so through the transfer portal, going and getting a Drake Nugent or a Josh Wallace or an A.J. Barner, you can do the same thing. You can find your own Olu Olu with Timmy in the transfer portal that exists for you, which is LinkedIn Jobs. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the best qualified candidates and helps you do so faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions do apply. All right, so ESPN, Bill Connolly, who we love and respect a lot, the guy who does the SP+, Plus, does the returning production, so we rely pretty heavily on him. Uh, he lit, went and threw all the kind of the big contenders in college football and asked, what do they need to do to win a national championship? The, the basically three ifs for all. I've got I've to fix this. This is getting on my nerves. All right, can't fix it. Okay, that's just it's just going to continue doing what it's been doing for two years, falling down. Uh, <laughs> so he had three big ifs or four big ifs, three. Um, number one, so I agree with two of his three. Kind of. Number one, if the receiving core improves further. Yes, Michigan needs that to happen. He talked about J.J. McCarthy. He says J.J. McCarthy completed 65% of his passes and finished 16th in total QBR. The big pass plays were mostly hard to come by, the Ohio State game aside. Uh, and he averaged 3.7 yards per drop back, 142nd and 165 FPS passers with at least 100 passes. These receivers need to help him out a bit more in 2023. Now, here's the deal with that. And he mentioned earlier about uh, the, you know they've got Blake Horman, Donovan Edwards, but th there's a good reason why Michigan wasn't exactly out there just uh you know wheeling and dealing through the air they didn't feel like they needed to they felt like they could do both things but as jim harbaugh had said very adamantly you know if we're gonna run the ball <laughs> and if you can't stop the run then why would we stop doing it it's kind of where michigan was right you don't need to sit there and bomb it out if you're running for 400 yards against penn state who was a top 10 run defense at that time right that said, yes, I would like to see Michigan improve more, but I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily need to do it throughout the year, right? Because remember, they did what they did in the regular season, went undefeated, won the Big Ten championship. It was mistakes and questionable, like, I, I want to emphasize the mistakes as being the primary, primary thing, but between the coaches and on the field, and then some questionable officiating that cost Michigan against TCU. It wasn't a lack of passing attack. I mean, J.J. threw for 343 yards. The two pick sixes, mistakes. Fumble on the goal line, mistakes. Not calling it a touchdown to begin with, officiating. Running the uh, that, that weird play on the first drive with Colston Loveland trying to throw to J.J. McCarthy, coaching mistake. Mistakes. As well as uh, the questionable officiating. So... He could, he could, they could basically replicate exactly what they did last year. As long as you play better in the college football playoff, don't get away from what your identity is, then it's fine. Georgia wasn't exactly setting the world on fire through the air in 2021. They could pass it, but they also ran it. 
Second one, I don't agree with this one per se. If another coordinator change doesn't backfire, talks about uh, Matt Weiss fired for computer access crimes. Michigan dealing with the quarter coordinator change of sorts for the third straight year. They just removed the co-coordinator from Sharon Moore, but Weiss had a major role in play calling. Listen, anyone who's around Michigan will call this all a net positive, right? The, the parts of Weiss's uh, play calling that we know of were the things that fans particularly didn't like. Red zone. So, I don't know. That's kind of weird. Plus, that's the only real change, right, is losing, uh, I mean, him and obviously Partridge in for Hilo, but it, it doesn't, it's not really a coordinator change as much as it's maybe addition by subtraction. And I say that as someone who liked Matt Weiss, but thirdly, and I agree with this. If the pass rush holds up, Michigan's ranked fifth in defensive SP plus and returns nine of 14 defenders who saw 300 plus snaps the last season. Uh, that includes the linebackers, junior Colson, Mike Barrett, corner, Will Johnson, Mason Graham. But for the second straight year, the Wolverines top two pass rushers are gone. Yes. That's something we've been talking about for the last, however long here. Uh, I do have faith in the foursome that they're probably putting out there. Braden McGregor, Jalen Harrell's back, of course. Josiah Stewart and Derek Moore, that feels good. But they've got to prove it. We've certainly seen groups of pass rushers go out there where you think they're going to be great and they haven't been and vice versa. So uh, we'll see. But that that one I agree with because if the, they can't get a pass rush now, granted, they are also you mentioned Mason Graham. They, they are trying to get more of an interior pass rush. That said, they, we've heard that before and they haven't necessarily gotten it. Chris Jenkins looks like looks the part. Mason Graham has been able to penetrate as well as we see more so on some running downs and fourth and ones. But we, we need to see that, in fact, they can get that interior pressure. It's been a long time. They were great on the run. Jenkins, along with uh, Mozzie Smith, they were able to do it against the run. But when it came, it came to the pass, they were not getting that Mohurst style, we're going to get you. So that is that. Um, obviously, I think that there are some other things. I think it's, it's less about the receiver stepping up and J.J. just being able to hit on some more deep bombs, which also takes the receiver, but it takes the quarterback as well. Uh, I think that uh, the cornerback situation is the other part that I would really look at. Um, all right, we'll finish out talking about uh, PFF's uh, top three football players, or three fit Michigan football players are in their top 50. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about them here in just a moment and go from there. All right, sorry I missed uh, Thursday. I've got some family drama going on. And uh, so we're going to do a Saturday episode to make up for it. I know, how many times do I say that and it doesn't happen? Well, I, I, we're trying to do five a week here. We really are. We really, really are. So uh, it was kind of a thing where I woke up and there's just stuff going on and didn't get to sit down to do a podcast, didn't get to sit down and write. And I was going, going, going until... Uh, like 11 o'clock and then finally it was like okay well it's too late because it's it's time to wind down so the the goal is at least to do a Saturday episode maybe we'll get to that mailbag I teased from like two weeks ago <laughs> I don't know why I'm, I didn't even read them it's not like there's questions I'm avoiding I just haven't gotten to them but we'll we'll, we'll try to get to that and get back into it um, I think that will be the goal is to try to get to that old old mailbag basically be answering questions of what do you expect coach first Chrysler to do? And uh, how, how do you think that the fab five will do in the NCAA tournament this year? It's probably about it. All right. So PFF, uh, they put out a list of their top 50 players going into uh, the 2023 season. Michigan had three guys uh, make the cut Blake Corum at number four, Will Johnson at 21 and uh, Chris Jenkins at 46, I believe 46. I'm pretty sure I'm not looking at it. I'm just going off of memory here. Can't remember if I said my name at the beginning, can remember the numbers that these guys were raked at. Um, so Corum was naturally the top running back. Uh, Chris Jenkins was the third, uh, defensive interior, uh, lineman and, uh, Will Johnson was the third, uh, was the, the third cornerback behind, uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry and, uh, Kalen King. 
uh, of those, the ones that there, I think obviously Corum, it's hard to move up higher. Uh, there's just usually an, an, you know, an edge rusher or quarterback is going to be ranked higher, such as the case for Blake Corum, right? He's behind, uh, he's behind guys like Caleb Williams, reigning Heisman trophy winner. Uh, so it, it makes sense that he's there. Uh, but, uh, I think that you can see Will Johnson certainly surpassed the other two. You know, I, I think he's got that skill set. Former five star going into year two. What have I said on this show a bunch of times? You get better going from make the biggest jump year one to year two. Will Johnson really only had had half a year and was already Michigan's best cornerback. He's going to still improve. He's going to make strides. I, I may, could there be a regression? Yeah, I don't expect it though with him. Um, then you've got, uh, then you've got uh, Chris Jenkins, who could certainly move up. He's starting to get that hype right now. You know, I don't think the Athletics released the uh, the typical freaks list yet. Bruce Feldman's freaks list. Usually, I feel like it's come out by now. Uh, maybe that's next week. But uh, I, I would not be surprised. You I mean, he often has a Michigan guy up top or near the top. I would not be surprised if Chris Jenkins is his top overall f- freak entering the year. Would not surprise me in the least. So uh, I think that he can make a big move up as well, especially if they do get that pass rush that we talked about going. If that starts really working out, looking good. Um, so those are those three. There are some, and this is from Max Chadwick, who we had on the show and over earlier in the off season. So there's a couple guys that he really liked that I'm kind of almost surprised didn't make the list, but I understand you're trying to whittle it down to the top 50. I mean, that's not even a third of some of these teams here, right? Um, but uh, you look at uh, a guy like Rod Moore, who might be, the, he might be the top safety in college football by the time this is all said and done this year. Look at his top center in the country, Drake Nugent, the guy he thinks is going to win the Remington. Uh, you look at Zach Zinter, who I think uh, very well could be a first-round draft pick and really just change the game when it comes to that. And then there's other guys that can make big, big moves. Junior Colson can make a big move. Mason Graham could certainly make a big move. Braden McGregor, who Jim Nagy was waxing ecstatic about. Uh, I think that he could also make a big move. There's a lot of guys on this team that are there. And that's not even to mention J.J. McCarthy. He's not on the list. There's five quarterbacks on there. Uh, no J.J. J.J. is typically revered as the seventh quarterback, basically. But let's say Michigan does air it out. Let's say he does hit that deep ball. It, we're so far gone for some reason, and I know that for some reason is Michigan's quarterback play under Jim Harbaugh. But remember when Jim Harbaugh came, it was he's the quarterback whisperer. But then he's in Ann Arbor, he's just kind of been like, let's just have him throw for like 170 to 250 yards a game and call it good. But like Andrew Luck, people forget, he coached Andrew Luck. He made Alex Smith go from a guy who was on the way out to being a starting quarterback in the NFL and took Colin Kaepernick, the quarterback from Nevada, and made him a household name. And when he left San Francisco, there was no Kaepernick to be seen. And granted, that has a lot to do with uh, with other factors and what have you. But it's Jim Harbaugh has tended to be very good with quarterbacks. Now he's got a five-star. Now he's got the best quarterback on paper he's ever worked with. If J.J. improves, there's nothing to say he can't be that Caleb Williams, Bryce Young type. So, I don't know. We'll see. That's all I got. That's it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else to tell you. That's it. Uh, so, we'll be back with one of two shows on Saturday Either the uh, either we'll finally get to that mailbag that we've been teasing for six months that we used to do every week up until t- two weeks ago, or we'll get to the roster over analysis that we haven't gotten to yet because that happened. The, they released the roster on Wednesday, and we haven't talked about it. That was the plan for today's show, and then all of this expansion talk got drew my ire, made copious amounts of jokes on Twitter, making people angry. <laughs> For some reason. Like, you can just ignore it. If you don't like it, you can just ignore it. If I say something stupid, I say something stupid every single day. Most of you just don't hear it. Anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We will be back soon. Peace.